Good evening, ladies. Thanks so much for braving the cold tonight. Wow, that's awesome. It's worth it, right? We get to uh, hang out with our girlfriends, leave the men behind. <laughs> we don't have to cook. And, um, but best of all, we get to invest in, into eternity, these amazing ministries that go on here at the Rock Church. So that's the best part. So, um, oh, speaking of not having to cook, um, I want to give a big shout out to the ladies um, at the Rock here who uh, cook tirelessly every month. Um, oh, and let's not forget the men who come faithfully every month to help out. We couldn't do it without you. Um, but the ladies, my dear friends, oh, where's that Kleenex box? <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever, I, I, I do, I don't think I've ever told, thank you, um, told them, you ladies, and you know who you are, that you are an answer to prayer for me. When I uh, moved back to Saskatoon, when I was living in Brandon, Manitoba, from working at Teen Challenge there, I told God, um, told God, like you do, not ask him. <laughs> uh, that's funny that I wrote that. That I needed uh, godly women friends in my life. And uh, so that's when he led me to help in the rock kitchen. And I got to hang out with the most wonderful bunch of ladies. Ladies who genuinely cared for my well-being. Ladies that you can laugh with, cry with, be real with. Ladies who, you know, actually mean it when they ask about my kids and my life and, and everything that's going on. So, anyways, ladies, um, I know I don't get to tell you much and I don't get to see you much anymore because um, I don't get to help out so much anymore, but I love you. So that's my little spiel, and they work so hard. So thanks, ladies. I am so honored tonight to be able to share my story of hope and redemption with you all tonight. Our God is a good and faithful God, and his mercy and grace have no bounds. God did give me victory over about a 12-year bondage to alcohol addiction. I could speak about how God also healed me of my bitterness, of my resentment, of my unforgiveness, of my anxiety, of my depression, and many other things. But as it is February the love month, <laughs> I felt led actually to focus on perhaps the one thing that was the catalyst for all other changes in my life. Um, my relationship with Jesus and my Father God. Um, how Learning how much that my Father in heaven loves me and also therefore learning to love him and to love myself. Um, in my addiction, my husband, Ian, is his name, so if you hear me mention Ian a lot, that's my husband. He would tell me over and over that I needed to learn to love myself. I also had an amazing Christian psychiatrist that I would, that I would go see. And while sitting in her office, I would blame all my circumstances, all my situations, all other people in my life. I would say, oh, if this could change, if only I could change that situation. Um, if only my husband weren't so controlling, and I did get his permission to say that, and it's not true, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she would listen so nice and just smile and tell me that I just needed to get in right relationship. <clears throat> Excuse me. Basically, just fall in love with Jesus, and everything else would fall into place. Well, all that just seemed too simple. And actually, it was simple. It wasn't easy. It was actually a long, painful journey, which I will share with you tonight. And at times, at times it was very painful, but it was the best choice I ever could have made to get help. So on your tables, you'll see that you each have a love letter um, on your seat. So this love letter is to you from your Father in heaven. It is all truth from God's word, the Bible, which is his ultimate love letter to each one of us. And it is God's communication, his love to us. There is a verse in the Bible, John 8, 32, and it says, um, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
And that truth is what set me free. I encourage you, I really encourage each one of you to, even if you've seen it before and have read it before, take it home. Find a time where you can have some time alone, quiet time, and take time to read it. Read this love letter from God to you. Just like God's love letter, there is also a hate letter. That hate letter comes from lies from the enemy, the accuser and master deceiver. For years, I was listening to this hate letter from the enemy. And I was believing it to be truth until it almost took my life. But glory to God, that is not the end of the story tonight. But let me tell you a little bit about my hate letter so you can understand just what God delivered me from. My addiction started in my mid-20s. Uh, I got help uh, at 39 years old. Oh my goodness, my papers are sticking. Okay, so what I didn't realize until later in life, a bit later on in, in my life, was that I was always searching for significance. I didn't know my purpose. I didn't even know who I was. I had no identity, or at least I found it in the wrong things, and therefore I was lost. My husband and I entered the ministry. Um, we were Christians. We entered the ministry soon after marriage, but we failed to get support and mentors around us and did not, especially me, I did not put Christ in uh, center. We didn't put Christ center in our marriage, and I especially didn't put Christ center of, of my heart and make him priority. We put ministry and everything else first. We both made some horrible mistakes. Our marriage started dissolving. I blamed myself. That was the beginning of the end. Also, because I did not know who I was and how much God loved me, I put high expectations on myself and compared myself to Ian when I did not measure up. And he's a hard one to measure up to. His sister knows how great he is. She's here tonight. I felt like a bad pastor's wife. I withdrew. I got bitter. I got jealous of his time that he spent at his church. The guilt came, the condemnation, the self-hate came crashing in. The hate letter began. Shame made me tell myself not that I made a mistake, but that I was the mistake. Not that I did something worthless, but that I was worthless. It was a slow progression. The enemy is subtle that way. So I found alcohol. I found alcohol took away the horrible shame in my mind. And after years, um, oh, and after the years, you know, of the slow progression, all of a sudden, I was in bondage to it and powerless to stop. Um, actually, recently, I worked at Cabela's. Um, and I would walk through the, the fishing section, <laughs> and I would see all these crazy fish hooks and they were like some of them were massive and these hooks are so sharp I was almost like oh I don't want to you know get hooked on these hooks I'm glad I didn't work in the in the fishing section so then you notice that phrase uh, I remembered that phrase like hooked on drugs and I realized yeah no kidding like if you've ever been fishing you know what I mean um, when a fish gets hooked on one of those hooks it's kind of like, like hooked on drugs or sugar or Facebook or TV. It's a great word, like whatever it is that you get hooked on. For me, the main thing was alcohol. Um, so if you go fishing and you see that fish and it's whatever it is you see and that's what the, the devil does with sin. It looks so great. Oh, that looks so good. I'm going to take a bite. And then once the fish takes a bite, or we take a bite of, oh, that alcohol was so good at first, it made me feel so good, you know? Once you take a bite, that fish is like, oh, this wasn't really food. It cannot get off that hook. It is stuck. So, I don't know, God just showed me that, that picture when I was walking through the, the fishing section at Cabela. And, you know, it seems tasty, but it's counterfeit. And it's not really what God has for us. But the devil gets, gets us hooked. It looks so good. But it's like that verse, you know, it looks good. But in the end, it, 
the wages of sin is death. So the problem of the cycle is, you know, the more you drink or the more whatever it is, it, the worse the, sh the shame and the cycle goes on and on. The shame told me that the hate letter just, you know, the more I messed up, the worse I got. The more in bondage to alcohol, the more I would just try uh, like uh, pills or anything I could get or a harder drug and anything I could get my hands on. Anything to numb the pain and the constant accusations. You are no good. You will never get freedom from this. You are scum of the earth. You are ruining, you, you are ruining your kids and all the people around you. The worst, um, so the hate letter got worse and worse and worse. The worst lie I ever believed was that my children didn't want me and they didn't need me. Their own mother. The enemy had total control of my mind and the hate letter was getting longer and longer. So that led me to walk away from my family with my bottle of booze. And I still hear my daughter's cries. Where's mommy going? I lived in shelters in Saskatoon. I had suicidal thoughts. I was separated from the most amazing man. That, and I know that God made that union. I know we were meant to be together in my mind. I remember every day I would say to myself, every, every day I woke up, I will not drink today so I can get back to my family. And the next thing I knew, I would have an empty bottle, one of those ones this big. And when I was passing out, I would hear the devil snickering in my ear, his actual voice saying, I got you, I got you. So I could not stop. I tried AA and I managed to stay sober for a little while. I went to a 28-day government-run program. I tried Larson House Detox. And I tried on my own. I was hurting so much family. I lost a job. Broken relationships, moral decline, stealing to get more booze. Things I never, ever thought I could ever do in my life. My family and husband never gave up on me. They never stopped praying for me. And of course, God was always there. He was always there, even though I couldn't feel him or see him. I could just hear the devil snickering. My husband found out about Teen Challenge and helped me to apply. Teen Challenge is a, a faith-based discipleship uh, addiction program that's a uh, minimum 12 years, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Did I say 12 years? Sorry. Well, that was my addiction. <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> okay. So, before I found hope through Teen Challenge, so I actually applied to there. Before I found hope through Teen Challenge, I truly believed um, a lie that the only way I could end the inner tor turmoil that that was to end my life. I honestly believe that was the only way. So that's, that's a real, real hate letter. But once I got into Teen Challenge, and, um, God started showing me his love letter, and the hate letter started dissipating. So this is how the love letter begins. So I entered the Teen Challenge program. And I know I do look like a teen, honestly, but... <laughs> I'm not. I was actually 39 when I entered the program, so it's actually for any age, 18 and up. There's no limit. It's never too late to get to find hope to get help. So, um, so my freedom and victory from addiction came from my journey of learning that I am loved. I am a loved, precious daughter of my Father God. My identity, significance, and self-worth now come only from that fact. God's word is showered with promises of his love toward us, toward me, toward you. It is a love letter. I was able to saturate myself in the program um, in God's love letter 
and truth was starting to set me free. I was learning about his character and who I was in him. Before in my life, my significance came from what I did, my performance in my career, in my role as a mother, approval of man, the approval of my earthly father. I needed attention, security from my husband, um, like, et cetera, et cetera, you name it. In Teen Challenge, not only was I renewing my mind uh, with truth, but I was spending time with God daily and opening up my heart to him. My hard heart was softening, and he was revealing his love to me. As you walk with him, with God, he, he shows his love to you in action. His words that I hid in my mind came to life in my heart when I spent time with God. I remember telling Ian that I loved him when we were, you know, trying to work things out. And he would say, don't just tell me, but show me in action. And so I am always working on that, and I'm getting a lot better. But that is exactly what God has done for me and what he wants to do for each one of you. But that's what he has done for me over and over. And that is how it went from my head knowledge with all the verses in his love letter to my heart by God showing me in action. So the biggest action he has done for all of us is giving his own son. He gave up his own son so that he could save all of us and have a relationship with all of us. But I just want to tell you some amazing um, actions that God has shown me since, since he's um, given me freedom from my addiction. So the first, uh, the second day I got into the program, it, I got there on a Saturday and I'm this broken, broken person. So the second day is Sunday. Well, you don't get to miss church when you're in Teen Challenge, I'll tell you that. You go twice on a Sunday, sometimes three. So <laughs> sometimes in the week, but that's a good thing. Um, anyways, I hadn't been to church for I don't know how many years before that. So, And when you're in Teen Challenge, you sit in the front row because you're not allowed to have any, you're like, so you don't have any distractions. You can really listen, take notes, and you just need to, to learn stuff again. So um, in the front row, I'm just feeling, when you feel like I just told you that hate letter, you're feeling a bit awkward in church, right? Like you don't belong there, you're too guilty to be there and all that stuff. So I'm sitting there, and it's a Sunday evening, and one of the pastors he, he looks at, at our row, and there's a few of us girls, and he just starts, stares right at me and points. And he has, like, giftings, like he gets words from God, whatever you want to call it, word of knowledge or prophecy or whatever. And he points at me, and he's like, it's kind of a lull in the worship, right? And he's like, what's your name? And when, right when he was looking at me, I already was looking down, because I was just like, no. And I'm like, Cindy? <laughs> and it was amazing because he's like, God wants you to know that you feel like a broken vase. Like it's shattered. It can't even be fixed. It's shattered so much. And I was like, the God of the universe is talking to me? Like I don't even know he's real anymore. So, And then he's like, God wants you to know he's not just going to fix you, but he's going to make you a brand new vase. And I'm like, like, so I wrote it all down. Because at that moment, like, I couldn't really receive it, but I heard it. And then, you know, like, in Christ we are a new creation. So, like, it's like six months down or a year later, I was that new, new vase. I am now that new vase. Like, God cares about us so much that he, he talks to us personally. So that's the first miracle that happened. And, uh... Then the first month I couldn't do any work. I, my anxiety was so crazy um, because I was still believing a bit of the hate letter that I, be, the, the devil was telling me a lie. Because you've gone seven hours away and left your children, uh, your relationship with your son is ruined. You're never going to, he's never going to talk to you again. He's going to not like you forever. It's, you've ruined it basically. So I couldn't get into my homework. I couldn't get into any work. I couldn't even read the first book they gave me. 
And the one night there was worship on, we were in the living room and we were just supposed to like have a quiet time with God and talk to him and all that. And I, I was laying on the one love seat and I was just, okay, well, talk to God. This is how I started learning just to talk to God like my best friend and said, God, I can't handle this. This is how I'm feeling. I, my relationship with Finley's ruined and God just um, then all of a sudden I, I was floating, like I felt like I was floating, and I had to open my eyes because I was not floating. I was still on the couch, but the peace, God gave me his peace, and I felt like I was floating. And then he gave me the verse, he's, uh, John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, peace I give you. Well, peace is obviously the opposite of anxiety, and I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. And I was like, oh. And he said, and then he said to me, like in my mind, you know, I am going to fix your relationship with Finley. It's going to be fine. And from that moment on, I could do my work. I was fine. And yes, me and my son, like there's more stories about that, but we're just totally better than we ever were before. Yes, he's a teenager and there's moments, but... So that was amazing. And then it was about, I don't know if it was two or three months, I hadn't seen my family, but they came for their first visit to see me. And you remember what I told you about what I believed about my kids and all that and, and leaving them? Well, they came, and my kids walked in to the house, and I saw them with truth. Like, the hate letter was gone. I saw them with truth their faces and their eyes and their love for me like their the reality and i i was just like oh my goodness like this is reality they adore their mother <laughs> so i was like thank you god for showing me that and that was the same time where we weren't sure if they uh if they should come because if it would be too hard for my daughter to say goodbye to me um but we prayed about it and stuff, and in the end, me and my husband decided that they would come and uh, see me. And we were still a bit worried that my daughter would have to say goodbye to me, so because it's a seven-hour drive to Brandon, Manitoba, which is where I was, and they're here. And uh, so, and I only get so much time. One night, um, that they were staying in a hotel and so much time that you're allowed in Teen Challenge to see your family and so then they had to go back the very next day. Well the next day they came with me to church and then they had to go home. And uh, they went to the car, we went, all went to the car wash for them to wash. It was this cold in winter to wash the ice off the car before they drove home. And my husband knows how to fix cars. He does everything to our own car and um, so he was just washing the ice off the bottom of the car and uh, then it wouldn't start. So my husband did not do this. Like, he knows. God broke the car. I know he did. Like, I'm serious. <laughs> like, there's no coincidences. Only God incidences. So that caused, like, just from washing ice off a car, the car broke. And we had to get a part. It had to stay in the shop. They had to get four extra days in a hotel. Well, my daughter is such a homebody that she did not even care about saying goodbye to me. She wanted to get home to her bedroom, to her dog. She didn't even, like, want to hug me. It was amazing. <laughs> like, I know that God orchestrated that. We got extra time uh, to see them. They took all the other Teen Challenge girls to their hotel to swim. They invited my family over for dinner. So I got extra time with my family, and my daughter was like, I want to go home. Bye, Mom. <laughs> so... That was a, a broken car God miracle. Um, one time, my, uh, I was done my year, and no, almost done, but I was going for like home for the summer, and my husband was so excited to go to the lake. I was, so he was telling me all about it. I was super scared to go to the lake. I'm trying to kind of be fast here. I was super scared to go to the lake, and I was telling God all about it, uh, but I didn't tell my husband because I didn't want to disappoint him. Last time I was at that lake, I wasn't sober for one minute. So many triggers, so many, uh, there's a pub there where you can get alcohol, and I was like, I, I want, my husband was so excited for us to finally have a family holiday, 
And I was like, oh, God, I'm really, really scared. You know, like, you can be so honest with God and just tell him your fears. And, and he just sorted it out for me. It was unbelievable. So the one day we, for some reason, we had something. We went at 4 o'clock to Fuddruckers to have a meal. Like, that's very early to eat. We walk in. And there's my cousin who, and his mom and parents who lives in um, Nipawin, Saskatchewan, that I haven't seen for years. And that's by the lake we go to, by the way, Tobin Lake. They're at FUDS at 4 o'clock having a meal because they were at some funeral. So my cousin comes up, hey, what the heck? How weird. And he's like, oh, my parents are here. And then I said, oh, yeah, I just was at, I've been at Teen Challenge, blah, blah, blah. And really? My mom's a life coach for Teen Challenge in the States. What? <laughs> and she lives right at the lake. And so that's God. So when I went to the lake, I had a life coach in my family the whole time at the lake. God sorted out my fear, like, just like that. Like, unbelievable and she ended up being my weekly call mentor and I still like it's it's crazy it was so cool and then um, my uh, my son when I was coming home back and forth you know to to reintegrate back home he still uh, fair had had a fear of trusting me you know oh, mommy's gonna have alcohol in her purse or mommy's gonna get drunk and that's so fair so I had to build that trust back and so he wouldn't uh, didn't want to be alone with me I think this was even a while later and we were going uh, uh, camping again and uh, so I, I just, I was like, God, help me to figure this out with him. Like, you promised me you were going to make it all right with my kids. And so I trust you to do that. But help me. Like, how am I going to do this? So um, I've been being super accountable in, in so many ways. But my son still didn't want to be alone with me. So we were driving down to go camping, like the family, or tenting <clears throat> at the lake. And I, I just said to him, you know what I learned in Teen Challenge? is how to face your fears. If you have a fear, it's um, Joyce Meyer, by the way. <laughs> if you have a fear, you gotta face, face your fears. And so, just an idea, when you're ready, dad won't pressure you, I won't pressure you, but if, if you wanna like say, spend 15 minutes with me, then maybe that would be a good way, but it's when you're ready and when you decide, and that would be facing your fear, because you've seen that mommy for so long now and that I haven't I had a drink and, and all that stuff N and I left it and that was in the car driving as soon as we got to the lake he said mom do you want to go for a walk that's God that was so amazing so ever since then we've been good and that was three years ago so um, and uh, so just just examples there's so 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 many more I just picked out a few of a few few examples of, of how God um, you know and even in that in that love letter some of some of my like just some uh, I just really encourage you to read it but some of the ones I love um, you may not know me but I know everything about you just the first couple I know when you sit down and when you rise I am familiar with all your ways. Like, God knew every horrible, disgusting mistake I made. And um, he still stuck by me. He never left me. And he still was just waiting for me. Um, there's another... There's another um, picture he gave me which was amazing when he told me it was time to leave Brandon and move home to Saskatoon, that he had plans for me here, good plans for me here. And uh, I was kind of scared, to be honest. Like, you think by now with all these amazing things, I would trust God, but that's who we are. We're human, right? And uh, so I was sitting and I told God, God, I know you're, you told me to move home to Saskatoon, um, but I feel safe at Teen Challenge, you know, in the bubble kind of thing. Um, working here and 
and uh, I'm scared. I've never been okay in Saskatoon. I'm scared I might fall again. And so he, I was just praying that to him, and I was just sitting in the living room uh, at the Teen Challenge house, and he just gave me this picture, and I don't get, or some people call them visions, I call it a picture. I don't get pictures from God. Um, so the couch turned into a huge hand, so it was God's hand, and I was sitting in this huge hand, just like this. And then there was a shield in front, like just a shield of light, just bright light. And then in front of the shield was Jesus, like all in white. So to me, it was, I knew it was resurrected Jesus, you know. And then uh, on the shield, there was black arrows coming and pinging off the shield. So they weren't getting to me. And then God just said, um, I go with you and... Satan's arrows aren't going to get to you. You're okay. Like, I'm going with you home. And that was all I needed. I was like, thank you. Okay. Like, why am I doubting again? But that's what we do. But, and every time he's, he's okay with that. He's like, come to me with your fears, with your concerns, and I will always reassure you. And that's how much I love you. I'm going to take care of you. If I tell you to go home, then I'm going with you. I'm not staying in Brandon. You know, so it's so great. Um, so, yeah, there's, there, I mean, if you ever want to know some more, then I'd be happy to share, but I could be here all night. But just, just to know how, how much he loves us, that he cares about all the details of our lives, and, and uh, that, and, and that, uh, his plans for us are always, always better than what we think. And I just want to end with, um, with a verse that I love so much. So it's Romans. Uh, it's just stuck out to me this past week or two. It's just Romans 8. I'm sure we've all heard it, uh, most of us. Romans 8, uh, 37, and I'll just read. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that's awesome. But the beginning of it, I was like, um, well, I know I'm a conqueror, through Jesus, through his love, but more than a conqueror, what the heck, like, conqueror is good enough, you know, but what is more than a conqueror, so, so to conquer is to be victorious over an adversary, so as Christians, we're all victorious over the enemy, because Jesus already defeated him on the cross, you know, we just have to believe that, just believe in Jesus and know that we're already victorious. So to be more than a conqueror, um, I just looked it up, um, not to just to achieve victory, but to be overwhelmingly victorious. So it makes me think of some, some of my son's soccer games that I watch, like, um, well, it could, he, he could either be the more than a conqueror or it could go the other way. But when, when they're winning like 12 to 1, and you see the other team, and they just know they're defeated. They just know that they can't come back from that. And the enemy knows. Do you know tonight? Do you know tonight that you are more than a conqueror? Because you are. I know I am now. I'm not, never going to believe that hate letter again. So if you want to know more about that tonight, you can talk to me. You can talk to Brianna. Anyone else, um, Hannah, Pastor Hannah that's downstairs, she can wave right now, put her hand up. Yeah, any one of us here, um, yeah, we would love to chat to you. So thank you for listening. Um, <laughs>